we find ourselves at war, and our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against fallen angels, principalities, and powers. We are here to liberate the oppressed, for I am a soldier in the army of God, and I will never desert a fallen comrade. I will never give up and I will never surrender, for surrender is not an option. Well, we come to the uh, final talk in this series. Uh, it's the title talk, actually, of this series. Surrender is not an option. And I'm afraid in many ways and in many places we've surrendered and that's how the world, our country, and even the church is in the condition that it's in. Surrender is not an option. No surrender. We are at war and our battle is not against flesh and blood as St. Paul teaches us, but against the spiritual powers, fallen angels. Let me read to you from a tribute written to our soldiers in the natural order by a priest, Father Dennis Edward O'Brien, United States Marine Corps writes, The Soldier. It is the soldier, not the reporter, who has given us freedom of the press. It is the soldier, not the poet, who has given us freedom of speech. It is the soldier, not the campus organizer, who has given us the freedom to demonstrate. It is the soldier, not the lawyer, who has given us the right to a fair trial. It is the soldier who salutes the flag, who serves under the flag, and whose coffin is draped by the flag, who enables the protester to burn the flag. Now that's the soldier in the natural order. Now take that and elevate it to the transcendent dimension of this spiritual warfare that we're talking about. This war is very real and it requires soldiers to fight. If you're baptized, you're in the army. You have to learn your warrior's role. You have to be a man. All too often, the enemy has won in recent years by default. We've been complacent. We've been weak in the knees. We've had that anatomical deficiency called a lack of a spine. And all too often, the enemy has gained ground as the result of it. I grew up in the greatest country in the world. I think one of the most moral countries in the world when I was a boy. The air of freedom was clean and pure. You could be proud to be an American. Now, I still love my country. 1967, I had a 4F draft deferment. And many young men at that time in history would have killed for a 4F draft deferment. That was a medical deferment. I didn't have to go in the Army. I couldn't be drafted. Instead, I worked with the equivalent in those days of a physical trainer to overcome a deficiency, an injury I'd received, so that I could get in. Why? I wanted to serve my country. I was 18 years old, and I loved my country. I believed in it, just like many of you, my dad, my grandfather, nothing new. That's what we do when our country needs us. We go. We're ready. You ever been motivated? You ever been highly motivated? You have to be highly motivated to be a soldier and to go to war. You have to be highly motivated to acquire the skills and the knowledge necessary to survive in combat. Well, you've got to be highly motivated in this war because this is the war to end all wars. You win this war, you go to heaven. You lose this war, you go to hell, period, exclamation point. I can't get around that. If there was an easier way, a softer way, 
I would have found it by now, and I'd pass it on to you. There is no easier way. That's it. That is in-your-face truth, and we have to acknowledge reality. Learn your faith, men. Many of you are the head of families. Learn your faith, because you can't give what you do not have. Nemo dat quod non habit. The expression is in Latin. All priests used to learn it. You cannot give what you do not have. Learn your faith. Learn it well. Take the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Learn it up one side and down the other. Read it in, in conjunction with reading the scriptures. Absorb it, interiorize it, live it. Pray. Fight the good fight. Don't be cowardly. Don't be weak in the knees. One of the greatest errors, and a fatal one I might add, is that all too often we have not fought the good fight and we have lost by default. We have surrendered to an advancing enemy one too many times. We've done it in the country, we've done it in the state of Massachusetts, we've done it in the Catholic Church. One too many times we've done this. I, I was invited by a certain archbishop to attend what in those days was called colloquies of bishops and scholars. This was on the West Coast a few years ago. I think there were 13 bishops and 13 theologians. I was one of the theologians invited. They had two presenters, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. One of them, now the, the topic was moral theology in the light of the encyclical Veritati Splendor and the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Moral theology in the light of those two key documents. And this key presenter, speaking to 13 bishops and, and 12 other theologians, among other things said, brothers, never mention sin. There is no sin. There is only immaturity. There is only lack of discretion. But no sin, never mention sin. Guess what I mentioned? And I, and I looked around, <laughs> I looked around when he was going through this, when he was giving this lecture, to see if the same kind of agitation registered on anybody else's face, or if it was just me. And I looked around, nothing. Nothing. Not a single comment. We all had a chance to make an intervention, and I made mine, and I told them what I thought. That's exactly the kind of thing that has undermined the faith for years. The theologians who say the devil doesn't exist, the angels don't exist. Let me tell you something, on the West Coast, they had a teacher of religious education, he had a doctorate in religious education, a layman, who formed all of the catechists, for the, most of the catechists anyway, and the DREs all up and down the west coast of the United States. I never mention names, I won't mention his, but this doctor so-and-so gave classes forming the religious education teachers. He went and gave a lecture in a certain big city on the West Coast, and one of the women who, one of the 2,000 plus people who attended my original lecture series on the Catechism of the Catholic Church, about 80 years old, well formed in the faith, after she had finished listening to him at the, at the end, asked him, Doctor, uh, do you believe in angels? He said, no, they're just a literary device used in scripture. Do you believe in the devil? No, of course not. Medieval nonsense. 
Do you believe in purgatory? Of course not. That would involve pain. God couldn't have pain. Do you believe in hell? Certainly not. A God of love couldn't have a hell. Doctor, do you believe in life after death? I'm not quite sure, was his response. I'm not quite sure. He had formed the vast majority of the religious education teachers on the entire west coast of the United States of America, and we wonder why we have a mess. That's why we have a mess, and yet the vast majority of Catholics sat by quite complacently as it happened. In certain Catholic universities, immoral theology was taught for a number of years until finally the bishops closed the door on it, tightened it up, and things are improving. Now, I've got good news for you. I, I travel very widely preaching, and I've met seminarians and newly ordained priests all over North America. I have good news for you. They are fantastic. They are excellent. We, we are, you, you're going to be so pleased with the quality of priest that you're going to be getting from now on. It's a magnificent improvement. In many cases, they're better than their teachers. Uh, some of the some of the teachers remind me like 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 recycled hippies from the 60s. You ever see a recycled hippie with the same old long hair and the same colored shirt and smoking the same dope and st slow in the head just like they were back in the 60s? That's what they remind me of. But I'll tell you what, their students are way beyond them. Their students are demanding the truth. Their students will pray. You know, in my day, it didn't happen in my seminary. I went to a good seminary, thank God. But in my day, it so happened that if a seminarian prayed the rosary, he was thought to be intellectually slow or medieval or myopic in his spiritual outlook. And you wonder what's wrong? That's what's wrong. But times they are a change in. So yes, in many cases, we have surrendered to an advancing enemy. We have surrendered without a fight through complacency. We weren't battle ready. We weren't expecting it. We got blindsided. In education, even Catholic education, my mentor, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, before he died, made this astounding statement. He was probably, in his day, the best-loved bishop in the United States. He was certainly the most influential. And he said, I tell all my family, I tell all my family members and my best friends, if you want your children to fight for the faith, send them to public school." If you want your children to lose the faith, send them to Catholic school. Now that is a radical statement to come from a Catholic archbishop back in the late 1970s. What did he mean by that? He meant that we had acquiesced, we had given up, we had surrendered to the powers of evil in the area of education, even Catholic education. And gradually, the truth was bent and twisted and distorted, and in many cases destroyed, and something less than the truth replaced it. And yet, in general, we seem to take it quite well. I can tell you, after many years of experience preaching and teaching, that I can go out into the street of a big city and take a, a Hell's Angel motorcycle gang person 
who is high on methamphetamine and filled with anger and violence and sin, and I can make better progress with him than I can with someone who's had 12 or 16 years of bad Catholic education in bad Catholic institutions who've had their mind and faith destroyed by false teaching. Easier with the Hell's Angel guy than it is with someone who's been given bad teaching. And yet, we took it quite nicely. We surrendered without a fight. Before I, I, I paraphrase for you the Soldier's Creed, I'm going to do it again now with the military code of conduct, which is what governs how a soldier acts if he's a prisoner of war. Now I'm going to paraphrase it for our purposes in spiritual warfare. I am a Christian fighting in the forces that guard the souls of God's children and the Christian way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. Now stop for a minute and ask yourself, are you in fact a soldier, a Christian, fighting? Are you fighting in the forces that guard the souls of God's children? Do you have any idea how much God loves his children? Infinite. Are you willing to fight for the souls of God's dearly beloved children and for the Christian way of life? I am prepared to give my life in their defense. Do you know why sin angers me? Because I have been there and I have done that. I have been to the dark places on the earth. I have been to the dens of iniquity. I have been to the crack houses. I have been to the dark nights of sin and degradation. I know what it is to be on the dark side. I have been there. And I have done that. I don't need to read a book about it. I don't need to have somebody tell me a story about it. I have been there. I spent years on the other side. And that's why sin, the enemy, angers me. Sinners I love. Love the sinner. Hate the sin. Love the sinner. Hate the sin. I will never, Article 2 says, Article 2 of the Code of Conduct, I will never surrender of my own free will. Do you have the attitude and can you say honestly before God Almighty, I would rather die than ever commit a serious sin again. If someone would put a gun to your head and say, commit that mortal sin or die, would you rather die than ever commit a serious sin again? I'll say that. Put the gun to my head, devil. Pull the trigger. One of the greatest things, one of the things I look forward to in in life is death. One of the reasons that I look forward to death is because after you die, you can never sin again. May sound funny, but you know, when, when you've been down as low as I have, I look forward to the day I can never sin again. Oh, happy day that will be. I will never surrender. That means give in to sin. I will never surrender. I will never willingly give in to a serious sin. If in command, I will never surrender the members of my command 
while they still have the means to resist. Dad, you're in command. Do not willingly surrender your children to the forces of evil. Priests, politicians, anybody in authority, do not willingly surrender those in your command to the enemy. As long as they have the means to resist, that means as long as there's breath in them. Never surrender to the forces of evil. You know, there are places in the world today that if a clergyman, Catholic or otherwise, would preach about certain things, such as abortion or even homosexual sex, they can go to prison for a hate crime. I will never surrender the members of my command to an enemy like that. You are about to surrender to the forces of evil. We've already surrendered in many cases with abortion. And now with the homosexual question advancing, you know, the enemy's advancing. You can see him, you can see him coming. You can hear the cannons. You can smell the smoke. The advancing enemy. Do we resist or give in to the evil? Throwing up our hands and saying, oh, it's inevitable. Over my dead, cold body in plain English and it doesn't have anything to it has everything to do with love but authentic love there are bills before various legislatures that will mandate a kind of promulgation and promotion of alternative lifestyles in schools. In other words, to be taught about homosexuality in schools. They have to be given an equal chance to see if that's what they'd like to do. If I had children and I do, my children wouldn't be going to any school like that. I don't care what it costs me that I'd pull them right out. We've acquiesced. Very often we've exchanged the glorious freedom of the children of God for slavery. You know, we've been free, and then we go back into slavery. We just give up and let the enemy take over. Article 3 says, if I am captured, and I would say that capture means you're taken over by serious sin. You're not in a state of grace. If I am captured, I will continue to resist. Now, men, some of you haven't gone to confession for a while. Some of you are not in a state of grace. Some of you have been taken captive by serious sin. Some of you are addicted to pornography and other moral defects. I'm not against you, I'm for you. Remember, the soldier's creed says, I will never abandon a fallen comrade. I will never abandon a fallen come. If you've fallen, listen, even if you're a priest and you've fallen into some addiction, I will never abandon you. I have met priests, fallen comrades. They've been captured in battle, taken over by the enemy forces. I'll never abandon them. I was preaching someplace in an eastern state 
And I shared my personal testimony, and when I finished, an elderly priest came up to me, and we were talking, and some people came up. He, he said in English, he said, we have something in common, Father. And then some people came around, and he switched to speaking in Italian. La cocaina. Cocaine. We have something in common, cocaine. And I thought, I said, oh, when you were young, you had trouble too, Father, like me? He said, no, now. And he was in his 70s. I will never abandon a fallen comrade. I I'm not going to rashly judge him. I'm going to try to rescue him. He was taken prisoner by the forces of evil. I will continue to resist by all means available. You, you may be held captive. You may be addicted to something, some sin, held in bondage, unable to overcome it. It might be pornography. It might be masturbation. It might be any number of things. If I am captured, I will continue to resist by all means available. That means I won't give in to it. I'll hate it. I'll hate the sin. I'll fight against it. I won't give in to it. For I am a soldier fighting in the army of God, responsible for my actions at all times. I will make every effort to escape to escape the bondage, to get away from that sin, to break the shackles that hold me bound. And I will aid others to escape. I will accept neither parole nor special favors from the enemy. I'll never forget that I'm a soldier fighting in a war. And Jesus is very, very clear that the man who sins is a slave to sin. John 8, 34. Freedom and truth are essentially united. Sin is a lie, and the devil is the father of lies, and that lie leads to death. It is equally clear that Jesus came to set the captives free. Let me just give you a few examples from Scripture that speak in this vein. Jesus spoke in the temple as a teacher, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Do you know what the motto of the United States Army Special Forces is? De opreso liber. To set the captives free, to liberate the oppressed. Romans 6.20 and following. When you were slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. But then what return did you get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become the servants of God, the return you get is sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans 7, 14, I am weak flesh sold into the slavery of sin. In Romans 8, 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. A note here on terrorism. Remember and never forget that the primordial, quintessential, master terrorist is Satan. And there is a link with terror, between terror and sin. The man who lives in sin is fearful. He's living in the dark. The man who lives in grace, 
doesn't have to be afraid of anything. From when I was a little boy, the devil tried to terrorize me and succeeded very frequently. Now, I'm not afraid to talk about it, even in a culture and some places in the church where you'll be accounted insane. If you make reference to these things, they already think I'm crazy, so it doesn't make any difference. For years, the enemy has threatened me. For years, he terrorized me. For years, I lived in sin, and I lived in fear of the devil. And then, Jesus, through the power of his cross, broke the chains. I went to confession. I said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's 20 years since my last confession. And the chains fell off me. And then, seven years later, I was ordained at St. Peter's Basilica by Pope John Paul II. And shortly after that, I was walking after celebrating my first Mass in the crypt underneath the main floor of St. Peter's in the Clementine Chapel over the bones of St. Peter. That was my, my first Mass. And I was making my thanksgiving after that, and I heard a sound, Psst, Father. And there was a man in the shadows, and he said, Father, would you hear my confession? And I remember thinking the profound theological thought, I can do that. And he began, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's 35 years since my last confession. And for the first time as a priest, I held up my hand in absolution. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I could almost hear the chains fall off and rattle to the marble floor. Another captive set free, free. And then a couple years after that, I was preaching in Pensacola, Florida, and my father came for the first time to hear me preach. And after a couple of days, he had to go back home, and he said, Hey, son, you got a minute for your old man? And I said, Yes, sir. I thought he wanted to have breakfast, and he said, I'd like to go to confession. And we went in the rectory, and my own father knelt down before me, and I heard these words come out of his mouth, Bless me, Father. For I have sinned. It is 50 years since my last confession. And again, I raise my hand in absolution. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And again, the chains were broken. And my father, the first words out of his mouth after that confession was, I've been in the dungeon for a very long time, but now I'm free. Now I'm free. And he was. In Romans 8.21, because creation itself will be set free from the bondage to decay and obtain the glorious freedom of the children of God. In 2 Corinthians, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. In Ephesians 4.8, therefore it is said of Jesus, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. And chapter 5 of St. Paul's letter to the Galatians speaks much of freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. And 1 Peter 2.18, live as free men. Yet without using your freedom as a cloak for vice. Likewise, there are passages that speak of being slaves to sin, slaves to corruption, and so forth. A great spiritual writer, an Italian priest, Father Lorenzo Scrupoli, 
in his writing Spiritual Combat says some very beautiful things. As good soldiers in the, or the army of God, I want to listen to this. I, I, sir, I didn't make up this concept of, of, of spiritual combat. This is as old as the church. Father Scopoli says, on awakening in the morning, the first thing to be observed by your inward sight is the listed field in which you are enclosed, the law of the combat being that he who fights not must lie there dead forever. That's the first law of this combat. He who doesn't fight has to lie there dead forever. Here, picture to yourself on one side your enemy, that evil inclination which you've already pledged to conquer. It might be that sin holding you bound, it might be pornography, masturbation, whatever it might be. And now standing before you, that, that sin, that enemy, that demon is ready to wound you and slay you. And then on your right hand, see your captain, victorious, the Lord Jesus Christ, with his most holy mother, the Virgin Mary, and her beloved spouse, St. Joseph, and innumerable hosts of angels, especially St. Michael the Archangel. And on the left hand, the infernal demon, with all his armies ready to excite this passion and persuade you to yield to it once again. And then shall you hear the voice of your guardian angel addressing you. You are to fight this day against this and these other enemies of yours. Let not your heart fail, nor your spirit faint. Yield not on any account. Do not surrender, neither for fear nor any other cause. For our Lord, your leader, stands beside you with all the glorious hosts of heaven and will do battle for you against all your enemies. Satan has repeatedly told me he will have me dead and in hell forever. I don't converse with him. I merely point out to him, take it up with my mother. Your mama wears combat boots. Your mama wears combat boots. She's the woman clothed with the sun. Moon at her feet, a crown of 12 stars about her head, doing battle with the dragon. Devil, my mother is the mother of God. My father is God. You know how little boys say, my daddy can whip your daddy. My father's God. How big and bad is that? <laughs> Fight valiantly then, Father Scupoli says, and be not loath to suffer. A soldier has to know how to suffer. He has to know how to, how to offer sacrifice. He's got to, listen, when I was in the Army, we, we had to suffer, man. We had to walk 20, 30 miles a day, 70-pound packs, rifles, up mountains, down through swamps, jump out of airplanes from 20,000 feet at night, be hunted by enemy forces, be hungry and cold and hot. Ask these men who just came back from Iraq what it's like to be out in the desert with a flak jacket on, in 130 degree heat, day after day after day, with the wind blowing 40, 50 miles an hour. You think you got problems. Fight valiantly and be not loath to suffer, for it is this toilsome resistance to your evil inclinations, this painful struggle against evil habits and sin which shall gain you the victory and win for you a treasure wherewith to purchase the kingdom of heaven and unite your soul to God forever. And so begin in earnest 
to fight the good fight and run the race to the finish line. This is a fight worth fighting. This is a battle where you must fight or fail. It's very easy. Moses said, two ways are set before you, O man. The way of life and the way of death. The way of truth and the way of lies. The way of good and the way of evil. God's way or Satan's way. Therefore, go the right way. It isn't much of a choice. It's a no-brainer. Surrender is not an option. Surrender is not an option. The enemy will try to overrun you, and he may succeed. He may take you captive. Even if you are held prisoner in the bondage of mortal sin, resist. Resist and help others to resist. Always remembering that you're a soldier in God's army. I have had countless priests come to me in recent years bitter, bitterly disappointed in themselves, crushed and broken, taken hostage by the devil in one way or another. Some of them were alcoholics. Some of them were addicted to drugs. Some of them were addicted to pornography or some other sin. They hated it. And they had lost hope. And what do I tell my brothers? What, what do I tell my comrade who I must never desert when fallen? I tell him, it often happens that in battle a soldier is wounded. It is not a disgrace in combat to be wounded only when you desert. You've been knocked down through sin, get up. You've been wounded for, through sin, get up. Get up and go on. You know, when you get wounded in battle, they give you a medal, a purple heart. Desertion is the crime. Being wounded in action is an occupational hazard. And that's a little bit of a side note. I don't, when one of us does something wrong, it's worse than when anyone else does something wrong. I'm the first to admit that. But be very quick to support your priest through prayer and reparation. Be warriors through prayer, your knowledge of the truth, through penance, offer reparation. Do little penances for the church. Fifteen years ago, if someone would have told me what I was headed into in the priesthood, I might not have had the courage to go forward. But luckily, as my grandmother used to say, isn't God smart? <laughs> Grandma used to say that, isn't God smart? It, isn't it amazing how he works? He tells us just enough. I, I didn't know. I was all, you know, had this romanticized notion of the priesthood, wanted to be a priest, desired it greatly, worked for it, and finally was ordained. And, you know, I, I came out of St. Peter's Basilica when I was ordained on Trinity Sunday, 2001. And, and I didn't walk out in the procession, uh, I floated out. Uh, for months, I would wake up in the middle of the night and my soul was singing, literally, my mystical thing. I'm a priest, I'm a priest. Thank God I'm a priest. I couldn't believe I was a priest, and most of heaven couldn't either. I was just so overjoyed. And then a year, a year, two, three years went by, and the honeymoon was over. And then I was down in the trench in the war zone. Oh, I probably might have chickened out if somebody had told me ahead of 
lifetime what I was headed into. But then again, what soldier doesn't have some fear at one time or another? I would have never believed it if they would have told me I'd have some of the experiences I would have had standing on that bridge late that night in a big city, police sirens, area cordoned off, a little girl out on a bridge, little teenage girl about to jump off the bridge and kill herself. Fourteen years old, three years a heroin addict, two years a prostitute. 14. Who would have believed that I would have been there? But that's not too bad. Who would have believed what would have happened to me with a young woman that I had met when I was living in sin in Los Angeles who had been a girlfriend of mine for a while and who was addicted to drugs and became a prostitute. I remember the last time I laid eyes on her she looked like she was about to die, wasted away from drugs, living in the street. I remember I walked away and said, she'll be dead in a month. It was 10 years later, 12 years later, I was in a Carmelite monastery giving a retreat. And the superior, the prioress, said to me, Father, I'd like you to come into the parlor at 2 o'clock. I have someone I would like you to meet. Now, this old girlfriend of mine was Jewish, but didn't practice her religion. Beautiful girl, but almost dead last time I saw her. I went in the parlor, 2 o'clock, Prioress brings out a nun. And underneath the veil was this beautiful girl that I had known years before, a Carmelite nun praying for the rest of us sinners. And I rejoiced in my heart. And, and, and how great God is. Well, a few years later, in the middle of the night, I got a phone call. I got a phone call in the middle of the night. A frightening thing, a phone call in the middle of the night. And I recognized the voice. It was the voice of this sister. And she was distraught. Things had gone badly for her. She had begun to lose hope. She had left the monastery, and she was in a brothel addicted to heroin, scared to death. She told me where she was. I drove all night, put on my secular undercover clothes, knocked on the door of the brothel at about 5 o'clock in the morning. And I, she had given me her professional name. And I asked for her, and then I saw her, and I tried to sneak her out the back door. She, she owed these people $14,000 for drugs. We got caught by the bouncer sneaking out the back door. Now, can you imagine in this day and age of, of pre-scandal, if it hit the newspaper, Father Crop is seen sneaking out back door with prostitute. <laughs> well, we got busted, all right. They caught us. I, I, I had take, you know, when, when you're in the military, you make contingency plans. I, I made a contingency plan. I paid out the $14,000 in cash for her redemption. And I took her back and restored her to Mother Prioress, who took her back and she's still there after about eight years of having fallen on her face. Now, I would have never believed it could have happened. I will never leave a fallen comrade. And then I got another call in the middle of the night and it was a voice I did not recognize once again in a big city and it said you must come father is dying and they gave me an address and I went and I recognized where what and where this must be it was a priest who had, I, I'd been talking to 
I'd been helping him to overcome some difficulties, but he'd been struggling with drugs, of all things. He had been persecuted by his own brothers. His sin was that he was Catholic, but he couldn't take the stress of it. And so I knocked on this door in this terrible neighborhood of a big city, once again dressed in my undercover clothes. And I went in, and it was a crack house. And I looked around, and I went into another room, and there was Father laying on the floor in a corner, half dead, from a drug overdose. And I picked him up off of the floor, and I began to carry him out, and as I, I was leaving, someone stuck a 45 in my face. And it had been a long time since I had a gun in my face. And when I was young, I would have done one thing. And now that I wasn't young anymore, I did the same thing. <laughs> I told him what I'd do with the gun if he didn't take it out of my face. And I took Father to the hospital. I took my fallen comrade, who I swore I would never desert. And I took him to the hospital and got him into rehab and counseled him and prayed for him and did penance for him and offered reparation for him. For I am a soldier in the army of God and I will never desert a fallen comrade. I will never give up and I will never surrender for surrender is not an option. We are here to liberate the oppressed. Jesus came to set the captives free. And so it is, my brothers, that we find ourselves at war, and our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against fallen angels, principalities, and powers. The rulers of this present age of darkness, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in regions above. And so I put on the armor of God. I take up the instruments of war, my spiritual weapons, and I press on toward the finish line. Surrender is not an option, for this war is a war to the very end, the bitter end, the war to end all wars. And so we run that race to the finish line. We help each other. We pray for each other. We do penance for each other. We offer reparation for each other. We stand up like men with a backbone. We don't give in to evil. We do not give in to the politicians who call themselves Catholics and then defile themselves by promoting the most un unbelievable atrocities in human history. For we are warriors now, fighting on the battlefield of faith. And God sees all we do. The angels watch, and so does Christ. What honor and glory and joy to do battle in the presence of God and to have Christ approve our victory. Let us arm ourselves in full strength and prepare ourselves for the ultimate struggle with blameless hearts, true faith, and unyielding courage. What honor and glory and joy to do battle in the presence of God and to have Christ approve our victory. God bless you, God love you, and goodbye.